Welcome to the Turning Lemons into Lemonade podcast. Each week, your host, Amy Muborn, business strategist and advisor, will bring you the stories of how successful women entrepreneurs turn their tragedies into triumphs to create the businesses that are changing the world today. And now, your host, Amy Muborn. So today, we are welcoming Canadian skin treatment expert, Renee Serbon. Do me a favor, give me a little bit of grace because her bio is pretty jam-packed. So Renee Serbon is a Sedesco and Sibtac qualified skincare practitioner with many years of experience with the pastiche method of skin analysis and is a pastiche recognized education provider. In addition to her extensive clinical expertise with skin diagnosis and treatment strategies, she's also a consultant to the industry in the areas of practice management and developing best practice procedures and protocols. Renee serves on the education board of the International Association for Applied Corneotherapy, where she helps develop multi-centric programs for individuals interested in learning advanced non-invasive skin treatment techniques. Welcome, Renee. Thank you so much for doing this. This is our second time around. And, (laughs) you know, I joke that the podcast is all about turning lemons into lemonade. And so, you know, with the real stories, I I had to go back to everyone and say, yeah, we have to do this again. And (laughs) you've been so gracious to do that. So I want you to tell us how you got started in your business. Yes. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to do it again, first of all. And congratulations, because I know that this is live going. You have the podcast has been launched and I've watched the episodes that is available so far. So you're doing just phenomenal work. I'm loving this podcast. So thanks for having me on again. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I'm so excited. Um, the how did my business came to be? Well, my work is aesthetics. I'm an esthetician first and foremost, and I've spent my entire career, like from the day after graduation through to today, really focusing on up leveling my knowledge in anatomy, physiology, and cosmetic chemistry. I knew early on that I don't want to do just waxing and grooming services, so I really set out to elevate my knowledge and the cellular structure and function of skin. And so with that, I kind of ended up defaulting into a lot of training and educating positions. And today I am an international industry educator in anatomy, physiology, and how to max, match cosmetic chemistry to that, but also business strategy, how to help people who want to be business centric, if you will, business centric, what am I saying? Skin centric, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, you know, so they, they really want to focus on corrective skincare for their businesses. And I teach them how to elevate their businesses to a level of excellence and blow the roof of not just their businesses, but the client results by bringing in that underlying understanding of a deeper understanding of the anatomy and physiology and cosmetic chemistry. And that allows people who work with me to kind of let go a little bit of having their columns filled with grooming services. Nothing wrong with that. Um, But you, you know, I believe you can be the jack of all trades and the master of none. So I really love it in the industry when I see people claiming what they love and really focusing on that as um, their specialty and niching down into that because it's pretty broad skill set if you do waxing and tinting and brow shaping and lash extensions and skin stuff and massage things. It's, it's a lot of things to entail. So even within a business, while you might offer everything, I still encourage people to specialize their team. So you might have one esthetician who specializes in corrective skincare, one that is more uh, skilled in lash extensions, for example, um, etc. Sure. So in that world, I ended up doing a lot of in-house training for the clinics that I ran and developed, but also, um, you know, working on case studies all the time. So I did a lot of research in my, like on my own clients in the community to test efficacy of treatments, efficacy of products, 
that type of thing. And so I was approached by Dermavigils, the skincare line behind me, to test an, um, the efficacy of a treatment called dermal needling. I don't know if you've ever heard about it, mm-hmm. but if you haven't, you should have a look at it. So it's called dermal needling, dermal rolling, um, or collagen induction therapy. They're all really the same thing. And so this company wanted to test the efficacy of the product or the performance of their product with that specific treatment. And the results that we got were so mind blowing, even trumping the results of the pioneers of dermal needling in our industry. And we were calling- Who, Who was the pioneers? The pioneer is actually a guy named Dr. Des Fernandez. He's from South Africa. Mm-hmm. And um, he has done phenomenal work and has brought this technology into actually helping a wound healing after facelifts and things like that. He's a plastic surgeon. So any, not just facelifts, but any other plastic surgery that he's done. So it really helps to soften any of the surgical wounds, etc. So he's done a phenomenal body of work. And there's another guy named um, Dr. Matthias Aust, and that worked underneath Des Fernandes. So really wonderful work. And then they realized as they were treating scars that obviously it has a beautiful anti-aging effect as well. It helps with open pores, fine lines, wrinkles. Um, it's wonderful for acne scarring, things like that. So it's wow. a phenomenal treatment. You're very limited in the States and like which provinces allows estheticians to do it. So in some provinces or states for you, it would be um, uh, doctor only treatments. And in others, you need to be uh, uh, have special licenses um, as an esthetician, as a licensed esthetician to perform these types of services. But nonetheless, it's really great to look into. It is a wonderful treatment. And I would say I personally prefer it over even laser treatments. Wow. So, yeah, so in a nutshell, the results were so phenomenal. And we wanted to have the product in our clinic that clinics that we were working, I was doing it with, a, with another person, um, you know, uh, um, yeah. in a different town. And, the, you know, so he, he was doing certain case studies and I was doing certain case studies. And then we put all our data together to present to the guys. And the results was amazing. We said, we want this in our clinics. And they said, oh, we don't have a distributor in Canada. And it's a second career. So the manufacturer is um, the guy behind the brand is Dr. Helms Lauschenschlager. Try and repeat That's that. That's a name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, um, phenomenal. It's a second career, essentially. So what I love about it, it's a, it's a passion thing for him. It's really not about the dollar. So he's just about the performance of the product, wanting to do the best for people to get really wonderful skin results with really clean ingredients. And so um, he said, um, yeah, so why didn't you guys distribute it in Canada? And we're like, um, we know nothing about distribution. We're like the hands on people like blazing the floor (laughs) in the clinic. And um, I had discussions with my mentor, Florence Barrett Hill, and she pretty much in a very nice, polite way threatened my life and said, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And such a huge opportunity and such a privilege to get asked because with him, you don't apply, you get asked or not pretty much. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful. And so we felt the fear and did it anyway. And yeah, here we are um, almost eight years later. So you just said so many different things there that I want to come back to because first of all, one of the tweetables that I heard there was jack of all trades, master of none. And I love that because I think that as entrepreneurs, because we have this like shiny object syndrome and we want to go and try this and do this and do this, it's really important to remember that there's something that we're really, really good at and we need to focus on that. So I love that you said that. Yes. What's your zone of genius essentially? Do you know, I think I'm really lucky when I was, I am young, but when I was even younger, um, (laughs) eternal uh, fountain of youth, (laughs) um, I listened to, um, or I can't remember if I listened to it or read um, a statement or a quote by Richard Branson. Sir Richard Branson, you know, Virgin. Mm-hmm. Um, love, love his work. Yes. So he made a statement and said that he 
is good at, you know, the things he's good at. And his mission is to surround himself with people who know a lot more than he does about specific things. And that's kind of has been his mantra from the get go. And that's how he really builds his business and amplified his business early on. And, you know, in the back of my head, that really sticks. And even though, you know, I haven't always taken action on it, I do know the years, financial years, when I really embrace and embody that, it's so true. It shows even down to the numbers at the end of the year when I embrace the help and try not to do everything myself and really stick to my lane, stick to my zone of genius. That I think is such a huge piece of valuable information. I know that a lot of women entrepreneurs struggle with not wanting to invest in a coach, not wanting to invest in a team. And they're always afraid that the money isn't going to be there once they start doing those things. But yes. I will tell you, just like you just said, I have found in my business that when I make the commitment to focus on the things that I do best, content creation, servicing my clients, being the strategy arm, then all of a sudden, my head is way clearer. I'm better able to focus on all those things that I do well. And all of a sudden, I have more products, I have more services, I'm launching things differently, and the money just comes. Whereas when we're operating from a place of fear that we shouldn't invest or we can't invest, or we need to do it all ourselves because no one can do it better than we can, then all of a sudden, that's when things start to contract. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword sometimes. And you're speaking here to someone who's very A-type personality. Mm -hmm. I am totally the person on the beach with my laptop on vacation, working away. Mm -hmm. That is me. I really have to concentrate very hard and make very intentional decisions to not do that. So it's better for me not even take a laptop with me when I go on vacation because I will, I just can't help myself. So I have to intentionally set myself up for success or for success and not have the ability to deviate, you know, from the other things I'm doing. So I really, I get that. And with an A-type personality comes a, um, <laughs> a deaf grip on control. <laughs> like, abs absolutely, right? So, um, so that's really hard. So for example, I have a, a, a wonderful assistant. And the last year has been a bit tumultuous for me and, and my assistant journey as well. But for example, like just this week, I said, um, I'm doing this questionnaire to give people for feedback immediately after we do a training event. Like we do this amazing four day training event that people leave crying because they didn't know what they now know about skin. And they go, oh my goodness, I've been doing things so wrong. And, you know, there's always one or two people that cry when I go through the anatomy and physiology and really question the modalities they've been using to treat certain skin conditions. So it's a lot of fun. It's okay. Everybody's okay afterwards. We rein everybody back in, but it's an intensive emotional roller coaster four days of advanced skin analysis training. And so what we really have been sluggish at is actually getting feedback from people immediately after the training, but then also a few months later to learn about how has it actually made a difference in their business. Because if someone is taking four days out of their busy schedule to come and sit in a room with me with no makeup, I'll add to that. <laughs> you don't get to wear makeup in my training because um, <laughs> we analyze each other's skin, right? So like, if you're willing to do that and you know, you, you're, you're closing your clinic doors for four days to enhance your own education, it's a big deal. I get that I do that for myself as well. So it's a big commitment. I want to make sure that the information that you learned is actually growing a business at the end of the day, because that's the goal. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. If it's not impacting great skin results, more money for you, all these things, it doesn't matter that you even attained it, right? So 
now we're building this thing that we want to follow up and actually be good about that because we should should have been already but we want to be good with that so there's two choices i can send the script to my assistant to create a google form for example that it's fillable and we can you know like almost automate sending it out and or i can do it myself so you know in the past i would have had these thoughts that oh Perhaps my assistant doesn't know how to do a Google form. So now I'm asking her how to learn how to do a Google form and then do it, which the first time, you know, it takes you twice as long. And, you know, by then I probably could have done it myself and do it quite adequately because I'm pretty strong in those types of things, but it completely defeats the purpose, right? Mm -hmm. The point is it doesn't matter if it took another person an entire day to do something that I could have done in an hour the point is that I didn't have to spend that hour doing it. Right. And I gained that one hour back to do what I do good, which is education, skin things, fixing people's skin, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a give and take and you really have to weigh up the value and what you spend your time in and what you're willing to let go and delegate. And it's still a process for me. I have to consciously decide to delegate. It doesn't come to me naturally. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you that I, I will tell you, I think that is my biggest struggle personally in my business as well is even with the podcast, we're just launching it this week and we've been in this ready, fire, ready, fire, ready, ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim, and have never pulled the trigger. And I've had my assistants creating all the social media stuff behind the scenes creating the episodes, editing, doing all of the stuff, but I couldn't get out of my way to pull the trigger. And the funny thing is, is last week I decided I was going to do it and I was going to pull the trigger. And so I'd had all these assistants doing all of this stuff and they'd done a very good job. But when I decided that I was going to do it, I was going to do it right then, right now, I was going to go and create everything in Libsyn. I was going to go to Apple podcasts and I was going to do all the submissions and everything else. And I don't know why I did it. Cause one, it literally took me one whole day when someone else probably could have done it in two or three hours. Right. But there was this, there was this thing in the back of my mind that I'm like, this is such a big deal. I've never done this before. What if I pass it off and someone else doesn't do it right and they end up messing it up? And there's all of this stuff that we have going on in our heads that because the buck stops here, I always feel like the biggest stuff, I have to do it because if someone else messes it up, I don't know how I would handle that versus if I mess it up, it's me, myself, and I, and yes. it's my fault. Right. So a big challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm also with not everything in life, but certainly work-related stuff, very perfectionistic. Mm -hmm. I wanted just so and so and so. Like, you know, I wanted centered, not left aligned, <laughs> silly things, right? <laughs> but <laughs> painful things. These are big things, people. <laughs> no, but um, that's also learning to to embrace imperfection to a certain level because I definitely think I gain more traction when it's done versus perfect. If I aim to get it perfect, it's never going to be out there. And, you know, some of the amazing business people that I've been working with, that's exactly the thing. They're like penalizing society essentially for not sharing your gift mm -hmm. and that really the first time I heard that and I swear I heard Chris Winfield said it in a way that really to me was like are you speaking to me I swear he was looking at me when he was saying it I'm like how did you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know it's exactly um yes um get it done get it out there and the, the beauty is even when people come back and they want to be the grammar police and things like that, 
because English is actually my second language. So that was like one of my personal hangups. I really wanted to be grammatically correct because it's my second language. So, but it's what I teach in, et cetera. So I feel like very, people will judge if it's not grammatically perfect, but you know what I'm learning? If the grammar police is out there and inform you, which I can't help themselves, sure. that's okay. I just go, thank you very much for letting me know. And then I go and fix it. It's not a big deal. My husband <laughs> is such a perfectionist about grammar and those kind of things. And not too long ago, he sent out an email to his subscriber list and one of the people replied back and said, you have a typo in your first paragraph and didn't say where it was or anything else. And it was missing a word. Um, so the funny thing was that this gentleman was emailing him to tell him that he had a service that made sure that these kind of things never happened and that he was trying to sell my husband on his service and the email he sent back was a hot mess. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the missing yeah, capitalization, it, everything about it was completely unprofessional. And my husband comes and brings in his phone and he's like, look at this, you know. And those are those things that at first it kind of feels like they're a punch in your gut when you get those emails and you're like, you know, yeah, I messed up or yeah, it just, it didn't go quite right. But eventually you realize that those things happen and guess what? We are not perfect. That's okay. And I would, I would much rather be authentic and real than hide and make everyone think that I'm perfect. Yes, exactly. Cause there, there is no such person. You know, you might be perfect at certain things, but nobody is perfect across the board. So just embrace that. And, you know, there's, there's a thing called graciousness as well. Like, you know, I could totally be critical of people's content, et cetera. But like, instead of focusing on that, just be thankful for the gift that is given and the information that's presented, right? There's, there's definitely better and worse ways of approaching, you know, even if you want to help someone with their typing errors and things like that. So, you know, it's all, it's all good. So yes, so, uh, letting go and embracing help. So tell us some of the struggles or the biggest struggle you've had in growing your business. I remember what you told me the first time and I'm not going to prompt you, but I want, I want you to just tell us about some of the biggest struggles you've had. The biggest struggles I've had, um, I think literally my worst day was, um, so when we started the business, I was in partnership with someone and um, at the two year point, maybe it was the three year point, I can't remember now, uh, yeah, just two year point. Mm -hmm. Two or three years. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, it might even have been just one year. But anyway, so I, no, it was definitely two years. So what happened is at that point in time, my dear, dear mother was doing all our shipping fulfillments for us. So um, out of Calgary, uh, Cowtown, if you guys don't know it, go Google it. It's interesting. <laughs> so um, she was doing all our um, shipping and fulfillment from there. And pretty much for free, like mothers do, right? Mm -hmm. They'll do anything to help their kids get off the ground and stuff. Sure. She's just amazing. So um, at the point in time, like we knew from the get go when we started our business that uh, my goal, my and my husband's goal is to start a family. And the journey with that has not been easy for us. So, you know, it was a big thing for us that I wanted my business partner to be aware of. Um, you know, anyway, so finally got pregnant, which was so exciting. And um, my son was born in December. <laughs> so a week before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, beggars can't be choosers though. So, <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> so um, yeah, so he was born and we all the way during my pregnancy, like I worked really hard to kind of remind him that this is happening 
it's not changing it's reality and my personal anticipation certainly was automatically that the slack would be picked up by my business partner and that i will be able to not step away but le certainly lessen my day-to-day -day involvement for a few months you know with a newborn um and then you know step it back up as you know as you do babies grow and you kind of get a little bit more flexibility at you know when time goes on so when he was born he's colicky oh my gosh he was so colicky i think i cried more in the first six months of his life than i did my entire life difficult baby my goodness and um we have a big trade show in our industry in february and i thought that my business partner would go in and, and do the trade show for us because it's kind of like one of the big deals and to which he said that he's not going to be in the country um at that time so we won't be doing the trade show so i'm like okay just rethinking what we're going to do and that's fine um Anyway, in February, we wrapped up our end of year financial books and, you know, I got the reports back from the bookkeeper and the accountants and like I'm doing a review at that point in time and saying, okay, if we want to grow, there's some things that we need to put in place. Like A, we have to start paying my mum because she's been doing it for free, which is not fair. Um, but also in business, if you're not used to paying that expense and you grow to a certain level, mm -hmm. then you don't have an, you know, you, you have an illusion about what that's going to look like. You don't have a reality of what it actually costs you to to pay someone to do that for you right yeah. so i said that has to change and we need to start paying her and you know a few other things um so i sent him an email with like a few things that we need to be doing um before our business in order to scale etc and at that point in time the decision was um that my business partner would step out of the business because at that time there was different different focuses um you know that my business partner wanted to pursue which is fine mm -hmm. however my personal response to that was oh my gosh what am i gonna do and i had such a panic attack well not a panic attack but literally i i remember the day because i was this might be too much information but this is very every woman would sooner would, would um resonate with this so um, I was dead set on nursing my baby because I know the effect that it has for skin and, you know, prevention against allergies and all the benefits of that. So that was one thing I was like, going to do it. Mm -hmm. No ifs and qualms. And this day I had nothing to give my baby. When I read that email, like, like that, nothing for 24 hours. And I remember bawling my eyes out as I had to give my baby a bottle of formula. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it seems so simple now. I laugh about it now, but I remember like it was so hard for me that day. My goodness. And then that, that feeling of well, what am I going to do? Because my business partner is all sorts of awesome as well. Huge knowledge base. And you know, that imposter syndrome sits in like, am I big enough and strong enough and smart enough, whatever to actually do this on my own. And I really had a lot of self doubt in that moment. So I, of course, phoned my mentor and my mom and, you know, my, you know, your immediate crowd of people that you do these things with. Um, and my mentor again, just goes, Renee, you are doing the majority of the day to day stuff of the business already. And you're going to do this. And, you know, Yes, no is not an option here. It's such a great opportunity. You're going to figure out a way to do it. She goes, I'm a phone call away. She lives in New Zealand, so it's not that easy. <laughs> but, um, you know, yes, um, yeah, you're going to do it because otherwise, you know, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but yes, it was really great. And her vote of confidence in me was really, it meant a lot in that moment. And one of the things I had to do as as part of the re the repercussions of that it was the greatest gift at the end of the day because my business partner is off doing the things that they love and 
you know, and rocking at it. And so am I. So how beautiful is that, that we are both pursuing, you know, our zone of genius essentially, which is just a wonderful, a wonderful end result. I didn't feel like that at the, in the moment, but you know, in hindsight, you just look and yeah, we're both set free to pursue our, our line of excellence. Um, and I had to really change my business at that point in time because I had a baby. Like my industry is really like a lot of travel to do training events and things like that. And I couldn't go and get more clients, like what we call like prospecting at that time, because I couldn't travel to go and do that with a newborn. And so I, in that year, decided I'm doing nothing but focusing on serving my existing clients to the best of my ability and make sure I'm giving them all the education I can within my limitations. So it means stepping up um, webinars and things like that, really breaking things down into like three monthly training events, um, you know, in-person events. My mother was there and like literally carrying my baby to and fro, helping me, you know, fulfill my goal with, uh, in relation to him as well. And my business that year and changing my business and not focusing on generating new business, but just serving my existing clients still grew 30% that year. And this is the story that you told the first time. So I'm so glad that you came back to it because you had so many elements of that story that I think are such good lessons for every woman in business. Number one, you know, partnerships. As great as they seem when they first begin, sometimes things change and people need to go their own way for their own growth. And that's okay. It's often very painful yes. and it's often very traumatic in the moment in terms of how you're going to adjust the business. But what I really loved that you said there is you talked about bringing your business a little bit back, a little more in house where you were doing more webinars, more virtual things. And that because you started focusing on the client base you already had, your business continued to grow. And so often we all get in this weird thing where we think that our business growth comes from getting more new clients when if we just had more services, better services, different income streams, that we could actually mine our existing client base and serve them better and make more money by offering more comprehensive services. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I went back to look at the numbers and this is where I kind of realized what I actually teach people, yes, is anatomy and physiology and how to match cosmetic chemistry to that. But I'm actually teaching them how to improve their business and streamline their business because I'm teaching them to have more effective communication with their clients as well. So I could see across the board that all of them were placing orders increased by 30%, which is obviously how I grew by 30% without doing anything extra except changing how I'm communicating and serving them. And so till today, that is really important. I love new clients. Don't get me wrong, sure. but I will not take on new clients at the cost of my existing ones. That's a great lesson for everyone because it's, it's so important that our businesses have been built on the clients that we had on the day that we started. And it's so important to remember that and appreciate that because often a lot of, a lot of businesses don't. Yeah. They, these are the people who helped me pave my road over the last eight years and brought me to where I am. I am forever indebted to them. So it's my responsibility to serve them at the highest level that I can. And great if other people want to hop on the journey with us. That's wonderful. Um, and I, do you know what? I actually take a lot of pride in that in this industry. Our industry can be quite cutthroat and people have a tendency to be quite competitive with each other, even clinic to clinic. And my tribe, for lack of a better word, 
um, really are so amazingly supportive of each other. Um, and that's really what I want. You, you know, there is no competition. You're just in collaboration with each other and you can't serve everybody anyway. That's why I don't work with everybody in the industry because not everybody has a synergy with me anyway. Mm -hmm. So I want people who have my same values, my same point of view and my same point of approach to skin than I do. And those are the people who I work with and who we just naturally find each other. It's such a nicer way to, you know, to build your clientele, to build your team even. So, um, yeah. And so that's what I do. And even in my team, I have a, a small but powerful team and, you know, we all work very efficiently and very well with each other because we all understand the common goal and work within the same value set to get and achieve those goals. Is your team mostly on site? Are they mostly virtual? Are they half and half? What does that look like for you? Um, it's a little bit of half and half. So my assistant is here with me. Mm -hmm. And then I have, I actually have one in-house, it's referred to as in-house sales representative who, who is in town. She's not always in the warehouse and she's on the road quite often. So she's like in and out. And then I have a few um, independent contractors as well. So we, we do a lot of virtual meetings and stuff. So they're not in our in our space like some of them are actually in the states um and then of course i do have like um a few other independent contractors that work with us um for more logistic stuff and they're not in-house either so literally in my physical space there's um two of us soon three um and then my sales trip that pops in and out love it mm -hmm. so tell me one of the things that i struggle with sometimes is making sure that I have all the systems to bring on a new team member. And I know that that is one of your specialties is that you really want, you've said it a couple times, a small but mighty team that works well together, great communication, same mission, same vision. How have you built that? So I, it started, well, let me just think about this. How did I build it? It wasn't always like that. It, yeah, was, it, is. <laughs> it was mayhem at times. And about um, two, two and a half years ago, I felt very fragmented and pull, felt very pulled in different directions and was always busy putting out fires. And I have to attribute that um, I got pregnant with my second child, who's now 19 months old. Mm -hmm. um, and But during my pregnancy, I was like, Renee, girl, you got to get a handle on this because your business will not survive mm -hmm. if you do not have stronger systems, procedures, and protocols in place. Now, it's kind of funny because in a clinic setup, that's my jam, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yet I didn't have it set up from my business. Like, you know, right. The, yes, the you know stuff that you're used to doing yourself that you know that in order to really scale, someone else has to start taking those things off of you yeah. and you need systems to make sure that they do it like you would have done it, that yes. they do it in alignment with you and your brand. All of those mm -hmm. things that we don't think about when yeah. we just pass something off to an assistant and then they come back and you're like, this wasn't how I wanted it done. Yes. <laughs> so, but, but even silly things like, you know, what day am I going to do my finances on? And like, how am I coping? My receivables are easy because, you know, it's automated, but the payables is a different thing. So then I'm like completely forgot to pay this bill and that bill. And now people are calling me really uncomfortably, like not liking that. <laughs> so, um, you know, and it's every now and then, like I still slip up on that, but it's way better than it was. So when I knew that I felt pregnant, I just happened to be watching, um, something came across my desk about the 90 day year from uh -huh. Todd Herman. Um, and you know, like the system is it just made me realize I need a system. I need to really streamline things and I need to get a plan of action together that's repeatable no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I just did it and um, really implemented, like I spent a year 
about nine months, the whole pregnancy, essentially building out um, systems and procedures, recording, you know, like on loom what I could. Um, and so that I could set myself up that I could actually have breathing room for about three months once the baby arrived. So, um, <laughs> so I was so glad that I did, and I really did it hardcore and I really am, you know, applaud anybody out there that feels a little bit fragmented and like you're putting out fires all the time. It's like set a date and just start and start with one thing at a time and just push through systemizing it, writing it down. My assistant will not know what's going on in here. I really have to get it out on paper. Now I'm not really good at getting stuff on paper, but I'm pretty good at a video. So I like, you know, things like loom to, you know, show something or even just to brain dump. I'll literally just click it on and sit and talk like this to, you know, to a camera to brain dump it, um, um, which really is helpful. And then you can have this thing called transcribing your videos as well. So you could eventually have it on paper. So I'm still having to do a lot of that, especially now, like in the last year, the business has grown a lot. So there is a lot of change that has now enlightened me to the fact that I need to redo some of that. Um, but that's the only way that you can actually see what your thought process is and put you in a, a, in a position to pass it on. Um, so I was telling you that we were having like ups and downs of assistant this year. So what happened is I had an assistant, um, you know, lovely, lovely person just didn't quite work out. So I went back and made an offer to my previous assistant who left at the time because I couldn't offer her full-time work. Mm, okay. So I was so excited that now I could go back and say, I have a full-time position for you. And, you know, she came back and then decided you know, internally, she's kind of moved on from us, which is fine. I was really sad. Ugh. And this is quite raw because this is like six weeks ago of that. So I'm like, oh, somebody is not, not choosing to not choose me. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Um, but anyway, let her go lovingly. And now I have a new assistant who's been with me like over a week or so now. Lovely. I'm loving it. But what I asked my previous one to do for me is to please go and record everything you do. Like I want, so for us, it's like you're getting an order. So can you open the email, how the order comes and how you print it, how you plug it into our system, how you fulfill the order, how you charge the credit card, all of these things. And she did an amazing job at recording everything. So when my new assistant started, I literally could just give her, as I said, here's the videos, yeah. day one, just watch them. So really relieved a lot of pressure. One of the things, and it's funny that you say that because I do something very, very similarly. I go and record myself doing things and then I give that recording to my assistant and then I have the video for training, but I also then ask my assistant to take the video and create a checklist of all of the steps because as soon as they create the checklist from the video, I can tell immediately if I skipped over something or I didn't describe it well enough. And then I either can keep the video or I can go back and re-record it, adding in the things that I had missed. So I love that. I'm that I found that. <laughs> that was so huge for me because I said, I like things done a certain way. And I felt like as soon as I started doing that, things were, things were done much more like I had hoped they would be done instead of the back and forth. No, this isn't quite right. Let's go try it this way. If I just recorded myself doing it one time, that if they took it and created a little guide from it, that it was, it was normally a way better procedure. And it's funny because if you asked me this question a year ago, okay, let's say two years ago, then I would have said, I don't have time to sit and record that and show step by step how to do it and actually think about verbalizing it even as I'm recording it. I, it's just way faster to just do it. Yes, it might be. One but time. you end up having to do it. Yes. So yes, take those five extra minutes, do it, teach it pass it on and you gain now the two hours that it would have taken you to do it to begin with for the sake of five minutes 
extra doing something that you still have to do in that moment, you know? So, and like you, when you're thinking about and productivity of your team, this is, this is where my mental hang up was as well. It's like, but if it's taking her three hours and it only takes me half an hour, like that's not productive time for her. No, that's so the warp way to think about it. Actually, what you need to be thinking is that you have gained back 30 minutes. Right. Well, and the other thing is it, when you first started, it didn't take you only a half an hour. Exactly. And so the first things I always like to pass off to my team are the things that I can teach them to do at once. And they continue to take that task over, over and over and over again. Yes. So, you know, where if maybe you could have done it in 30 minutes, but over the course of a week, that 30 minutes would have been duplicated four times by you having to do it four different times at 30 minutes a time, then all of a sudden, okay, it took her three hours the first time. But the second yeah. time it's going to take her less. And the third time it's going to take her less. Exactly. And eventually she may, she, it, she may get to a point where it still always takes her 45 minutes or an hour, but or she might be able to yeah. do it in 15. <laughs> and that's normally, especially with the tech, you know, yeah. just because oh. we can doesn't mean we should. Oh, absolutely. 100%. So. Yeah. So I have my graphics girl. Yes. It might take me you know, a day to wait for her to send it to me and I could go on and do something okay and it might take me an hour. But the point is I, I didn't have to lift a finger to do it and she presents work that is five times, 10 times, a million times better than I could do anyway. So perfect. Yes. I, I hear you. Graphic design is one of those things that I certainly wish I could do it better. But guess what? That is not one of my biggest Right. skill set. So yeah, I just need to, yeah. just need to pass that off. Yeah. So the only thing with stuff like that to me is come, it's like, Oh, I really wanted it left aligned and now it's centered or whatever. It's like, let it go. It doesn't yeah. matter because yeah. nobody else notices that really it's, yeah. it's out there. It's done. It's beautiful. Go with it. <laughs> so yes. tell me, what hmm. is the number one piece of advice that you would give a woman growing a business today? I think you have to be selfish of your time. Mm, that's a good one. Yes. So for me, I think self-care is really important. And I was just having this discussion with someone this week, actually saying, I do, like I just went for my monthly massage yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so does that count of self, as self-care? And I said to her, you know what? In the moment, I actually am going to say no, because that is literally the things I have to do to look after myself, to keep myself from falling apart, right? Mm -hmm. So that's different than actually take time out to do the wants. So I see the massage thing for me, you know, because you do a lot of computer work, you know, I need that. It's a need versus a want. Mm -hmm. So you have to make time to do the things you want, mm -hmm. whether that is binging on Netflix for two hours, three hours, half a day, whatever that is, taking a walk by the beach, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond the things you have to do to keep the machine going. I mean, your physical machine going. So I think that we need to up our game in self-care and include things we want and desire to do. Um, second to that is really compartmentalize if you can. And this is really hard for me because I am the person that will be at home with my children and my husband and, you know, my brain deviates to my to-do list for work or oh, I really need to be, you know, like I don't have time. I really should be sending out this email or responding to this inquiry and so forth. So exercising mindfulness that when you're doing family things, that you're focused on doing that and literally trying to detach from work and vice versa. Because otherwise you end up in this mom guilt type of scenario all the time that when I'm at work, I feel guilty because I feel like I should be spending more time with my children. And when I'm with my children, I feel guilty because I should be spending more time doing the things that work requires me to do. Um, and realizing that there will always be a level of that internal tug of war and you know, being okay with that and just doing the best you can be kind and nurturing to yourself mm -hmm. um, and learn to say no. I think that's the biggest thing. Learn to say no. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I messaged a friend the other day. I said to her, okay, today I want you to report back at the end of the day and tell me which three things you said no to. Mm. Yes. And sometimes it is a lunchtime meeting with a friend that you haven't seen in a while. But and for me, I really am conscious in when I'm allowing myself to do that because I'm, it's never an hour. It's never an hour because you desire that connection with people. So you really should, it's better to, for me to actually consciously book that time out and go and do it intentionally rather than doing it in the middle, trying to squeeze it in the middle of a day. Cause you're then not present either way. You're worried about the business as you're sitting there chatting with your girlfriend and your girlfriend is not getting the attention that you wanted to give her because your head is in a different space. I love that because I think that one of the biggest things that I'm seeing with so many of the really successful women that I know is that they feel constantly pulled and they feel pulled by their business. They feel pulled by their family. They feel pulled by their friendships and then they feel pulled by their own physical well-being because a lot of times I've heard someone say that you can do three things at a time, you know, you can do your business, family, um, fitness, friendships, or spirituality, but you can only do three of them at one time, and two of them are going to drop. And I find that to be so true in my life. And I have to remind myself on an almost daily basis that I did not launch my business because I wanted to work more. I launched my business because I wanted to work less and I wanted to have more time with the people that mattered to me. And that is a constant reminder for me because, you know, it's sometimes hard to say I'm heading out next week to go see my family in Chicago. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that need to get done before I leave because when I go, I don't want to spend the week that I'm there on my computer the whole time. And it's just, it's so important that we're present and that we realize what's valuable to us. Exactly. And you know what? Let go of the guilt when, when the foot is lifted off the throttle in one of those departments. It's okay. You can't, you can't have full throttle on everything at the same time. So I am a great believer. I can do anything and everything I set my mind to. I just can't do it at exactly the same time. Love it. I love so, that. Yeah. So that is, that is how I approach it. And you know, I don't want to, I have children. So like if I'm thinking, what do I want my kids to remember? What is the legacy I'm leaving behind? Why did I start this business? Well, A, because I like answering to me um, because my way is the right way. (laughs) I I kind of like it like that. (laughs) I just do things the way that I like it. And being an entrepreneur, you, you, you have, more um more leverage to design things the way that you desire right i took on board the financial risk of entrepreneurship so that i can have flexibility in certain capacities of my life right Mm -hmm. so that's another thing and you know to set my schedule the way that i desire it doesn't mean that you that you don't work hard, you actually work extremely hard, mm-hmm. but, you, but you get to do it the way that you want to do it, if yeah. you're smart about it, and like, but you can easily allow it to consume your being, and that is the trap of entrepreneurship. You, 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 you gotta put definite, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, ba- borders, uh, boundaries. borders. Boundaries is the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Yes, you've got to, you really know what your boundaries are and adhere to the boundaries that you set out because it's also confusing to the people around you, your team, your loved ones, if you, if you deviate on what you, what you intended your boundaries to be. So once you set your boundaries, try and stick to it because I find that creates clear understanding across the board. Sure. Mm -hmm. So tell our listeners where they can find you. Where they can find me? Well, um, I think Facebook is, I love Facebook. I hang out on Facebook all the time. So Renee Sorbonne, dermal educationist um, or skin expert. 
um, it shows up as one of one or the other. So just type in Renee Sorbonne, it will pop up. LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So you can find me there um, or you can email me, Renee at dermalsystems.com. And my Renee is with one E. We don't waste ink. I love it. Well, we'll include all that stuff in the show notes too, but I always like for anyone that's driving or on the treadmill or whatever, as they're listening to this, we like them to hear it too. So thank you so much for your time. This was so fun. Thank you. And thank you for being a sole entrepreneur that I know that I can just, sometimes you just want to bounce ideas and know that someone's in a similar situation that you're not alone. So definitely connect with people because it's so important as entrepreneurs. Otherwise, the world of entrepreneurship of entrepreneurship, really can feel lonely. So make sure you build your own tribe of loved ones who have the same mindset as you do. And I am so thankful for having you as one of those people in my life, Amy. Thank you so much. I feel the same way about you, Renee. Thank yeah. you. In today's episode, we talked about masterminds and mentors. So if you would like our free checklist on questions to ask before joining a mastermind, please go to the show notes at LemonadePodcast.com. Thank you for listening to Turning Lemons into Lemonade, where women go for support and encouragement to hear how other women business owners turn their setbacks into successes to create six and seven figure businesses. We look forward to seeing you next week.